From the Alvin and Rosalie Sarachek Studio, PBS Kansas presents Kansas Week. Do we need a do-over of the 2020 elections and a ban on electronic voting machines now? That's what a handful of Kansans are trying to convince a court to do. Plus, the two men who want to become Kansas' next attorney general go head-to-head -head in their first debate. What impact will their answers have on a tight race? But first, the fight over transgender sports and Kansas politics. Who's telling the truth? That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. And welcome to Kansas Week. I'm your host, Pilar Pedraza. This has been a big week for state politics as October nears and campaigns scramble for votes. And the governor's campaign, that's brought social issues like transgender athletes back into the headlines as a war of words erupted between the gubernatorial candidates. You may have seen my opponent's attacks, so let me just say it. It's a war of words okay. over where the governor stands on transgender athlete rights. Republican ads have repeatedly attacked her for twice vetoing a transgender athlete ban in Kansas state schools. And that's fact. The governor did veto those bills, saying she was concerned about economic damage to the state from loss of business. She also said the issue should be left up to families, schools, and sports associations. In her latest ad, the governor responded to the attacks. Of course men should not play girls sports. But which side is telling the truth? We asked political analyst Dr. Russell Arbin Fox at Fringe University. The truth is going to be what kind of attitude do you take towards uh, people who transition? He says one key point about Kelly's response is her use of the words men in girls sports, repeating a phrase used often in the ads attacking her. From Laura Kelly's push to allow men to compete against girls in sports. Men in girls sports is language that is intended to connect with uh, you know, a lot of fears of pedophilia. These ads are designed to tap into a lot of really primal fears. They're not accurate because of course, we're not talking about grown men and small children. As for the fairness of transgender athletes competing with women and girls, attitudes toward the governor's vetoes will depend on your definition of what makes one male, female, or anything else. Are you gonna insist that there is no such thing as a sexual diaphora? and so therefore you're stuck with the gender that you were born with. For a lot of people, especially the people that these Republican ads are reaching out to, that's really straightforward. And she's gonna be able to come back and say, well, but that legislation has to do with trans women who want to be able to compete and here to break this down, along with a number of other topics, we have Kansas Democratic State Representative Henry Helgerson and Republican and former state senator Phil Journey. Plus, joining us by Zoom, we have political analyst Dr. Beth Vanami from the University of Missouri KC. Thank you all for being here today. And Beth, since we've got you up in the spotlight right now, I'm going to start with you. As we look at this issue, you know, it's kind of popped up. It's been kind of in the background for a while. It's not the only social issue that's really started to pop its head up in this race. What does that tell us about the condition of the race itself? Well, I think this issue's become a hot topic, not just in this race, but in uh, among Republicans across the country. And I think it's become a hot topic because the uh, Republicans are very much united on this issue, uh, with a vast majority opposed to the idea of transgender rights, particularly in the case of sports. And Democrats are quite divided themselves, and that offers Republican candidates an opportunity to use this as sort of a wedge issue for Democrats. So I think it's one of these cultural issues that has replaced gay marriage, gay rights, and abortion as sort of the hot topics for Republicans to be discussing. All right, so here on the desk, guys, you guys both watch this, you're active in politics. What are your thoughts as you're seeing this issue come up again and again? Phil, you know I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Giving me that look. You know, okay, this issue is like many other election cycles, the issue that's intended to energize the base. Both sides are trying to use this issue in that way. And it really, is not a normal issue for Kansas politics in statewide offices. Usually governor's race, AG's race, it's about competency, it's about running the state. It's not about this one. I think Governor Kelly made a mistake 
and the way she responded, I think she sh should probably have come back with, you know, it's a local issue. Let's let local school boards decide. They know the kids better than the state legislators ever will, you know, and they can make those decisions and, you know, the school board could bind the Kansas Sports Authority and, and they could go forward with that. I, the articles I have read in the past say it's just a handful of individuals that this might be applicable to and it seems like an old Shakespeare play but you do about nothing. All right, Henry, what are your thoughts? I agree totally. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah, from all the information we had, it is much to do about nothing. Uh, there are some men or women that struggle through this process. And one thing that strikes me is there's little discussion or compassion about how, it, how they feel about this and how difficult it is for them to go through. I don't remember of hearing one instance in Kansas that it became a problem. It, the, it, the, art, the commercial they were using was from out of state. But what really bothers me is these people need assistance and support. And maybe we don't have, or maybe the governor didn't make the perfect statement response. Uh, well, let's be frank, she didn't. She should have <laughs> simply said, my veto stands for those reasons. But people understand that if you take a position and you believe in it and you stand by it, they'll accept that. It's the waffling that always causes problems. Wow. So we know that this race appears to be very tight. Can we expect to see more issues like this popping up, trying to energize the bases? Uh, we're in the, we're getting pretty close to goofy time. <laughs> yeah, goofy time is usually about two weeks before voting starts, and we're right on the cusp of that. Uh, there are already states that are early voting in uh, the general election. So uh, I expect there will be other attempts. Uh, we'll probably see another crazy text message from somebody like we saw in the primary that people trying to mislead others. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think if voters stay focused on what issues that matter to them, they'll probably make the best decision they can collectively. Beth, do you agree? Is this something you think that we're going to see more of as we get closer to Election Day? Or are we kind of too close at this point? Yeah, I actually think this issue is going to continue to be an issue because I think the Kelly team thought they were putting the issue to rest with a sort of an ambiguous advertisement. Um, but I think they're wrong. I think this issue is going to continue to be brought up. And I think we're only at the tip of the iceberg for the mailers that will be sent out, the text messaging, the emails that everyone will be receiving about the race generally. But I think this issue is just going to continue. Um, it's going to be a, an issue that is talked about not just by the Schmidt campaign, but I think by the um, external groups that are going to fund some of these advertisements. We're going to see more of this, I think. All right. Well, perhaps all of this a sign of what the latest poll in this race is telling us. It remains a dead heat. KSN's Hannah Adamson breaks down the numbers for us. The poll confirms what we've all assumed for a long time is that this is going to be a very competitive race, likely going to go down to the wire or get out the vote efforts in those last few days will make a difference. New results of the KSN Emerson College The Hill poll show incumbent candidate Governor Laura Kelly and Attorney General Derek Schmidt in a neck and neck race. It's Political analyst Dr. Like Jeff Jarman says gone. he expects those numbers to fluctuate in favor of both candidates as more polls are released least closer to election day. Moderate Republicans and independents are probably always the group that decide whether it'll be a Democrat or a Republican who get elected. Dr. Jarman says the influx of independents who voted in the latest primary election could lead to an even bigger influx of voters in the gubernatorial race. Historically, independents are much more conservative leaning. And in this poll, they look like they are breaking for Kelly more and that might be a hold that really might be a holdover from the August 2nd um, vote. Despite the poll numbers, Jarman says he doesn't think it will change either campaign strategies. These candidates will like what they see. The survey shows that Republicans are interested in the economy and, and issues of the economy and Democrats are interested in issues of the economy, but also health care and abortion. And that plays into the strong suits for both of these candidates. So what's the most telling number here? Henry, it's your turn to start. I think it's a dead heat. And I think, uh, I, I think what we'll see is it'll tighten up 
uh, and the independents, I don't know how they'll break. And it may be just simply because the last minute advertising, maybe by who goes out and gets more people to the polls. It's going to be real close. All right. And Phil, I know you've been uh, studying these numbers closely for a while now. What about you? What do you think is the most interesting point? Well, I, th I think one of the important things is how will our Ross Perot, Senator Pyle, do, and will he change the outcome? He certainly has that potential. The fact that he's pulling at 3% shows that he's, out, he's underperforming others who have run as a third party or as an independent in the past. And if that holds, I think that helps. Uh, <clears throat> I, help that, I think that helps the Attorney General. Uh, generally, a governor's races are about the ability to run the state. And so I think that those kinds of issues, taxes, spending, uh, what's going on with our unemployment now that we've found out we've got nearly a half a billion dollars in fraud, how are those things going to play into the race? And I think those issues will become more important as we get closer to Election Day. I think it's also important to remember that for the last four cycles, the polling has been way off. And it's easy to play horse race and not pay attention to what's going on in voters' minds. It's a lot easier to look at the numbers than look at why the numbers say what they say. So I think everything's telling me that actually that it's probably off quite a bit and that um, it's not in the Attorney General's favor. Okay, interesting point there. Beth, this is your uh, bailiwick here. The, this poll, how trustworthy would you call it? Well, I think something to keep in mind is we don't typically talk about the margin of error, but the reality is that the margin of error is 3%. The gap between the two candidates is 2%. So it really is the case that it's a dead heat, as was mentioned. Um, I think it's going to come down to turnout and whether or not Democrats can mobilize some of those new voters that came out on August 2nd to vote their direction. I think there's been a lot of talk and, and probably too much talk about how August 2nd bodes well for the Democrats. I think it does if those are new voters. Um, but I suspect that a good portion of the voting no group was um, independents and Republicans. And those folks are not going to vote for Kelly in November. So I, I think it's it's cautious optimism for the Democrats, the August 2nd votes. But I, I think the, um, the race is going to be a toss up to the end and depend on who gets their voters out. Well, and another thing uh, that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, Beth, with these polls are the positives and negatives. But this is a show for people who are, poli who are politics nerds like us. So <laughs> the positives and negatives in this poll for Derek Schmidt and Laura Kelly, I found kind of interesting. They had identical negatives, but Kelly's positives were much higher. Yeah, I think that comes down to the fact that he, she's more familiar to voters. So one of the things that's interesting about voters is that if they don't know the person, they're a little bit more cautious in offering that approval. And so I, I do think that's about her being more familiar to voters and which could help Schmidt or not. I mean, if people get to know him more, they may be less likely to vote for him, but there's certainly, um, I think that's something we should pay attention to. Uh, certainly a candidate who has flip numbers where they have more disapproval than approval, uh, that's that's a problem going into an election. Okay, Phil, quickly. Okay, I think she hit the nail on the head. I think that uh, Derek Schmidt's lower numbers on his known and positives demonstrates that in fact, he probably needs to work on Kansans getting to know him a little bit more to work on those. Uh, a campaign runs a real risk that if they don't build that trust first and then they go negative, that all of a sudden they will lose their positives if they go negative and people don't trust them and it seems disingenuous. Yeah. So, you know, I think he needs to go back and kind of reintroduce himself to the voters and get that done the next 10 days or so and then move over to what we all know the campaign's probably going <laughs> to turn into for both sides. Okay. Yeah. Well, the same poll showed the race for attorney general to also be running neck and neck right now with Kobach holding on to just a two point lead. Although there are 16% of voters who are undecided. The two candidates met head to head in Wichita for a debate at the crime commission this week. Cakes Jackson Overstreet takes us there. In a side room at a local steakhouse in Wichita, two men make their case to be the next attorney general of Kansas in front of the Wichita Metro Crime Commission. Public safety is my life's work. That's what my faith has told me I'm supposed to do. We need someone with experience and I will step up for that role. 
On one side of the ballot is Democrat Chris Mann, a foreign police officer and prosecutor. Mann has three priorities if he were to be elected. One of the most important things we need to do is drive down the violent crime rate. And we need to uh, make sure that consumer fraud uh, victims are helped because it often um, uh, hurts our most vulnerable Kansans. And we need to make sure that we're uh, going after folks who are committing Medicaid fraud as well. His opponent, former Secretary of State Republican Chris Kobach. Kobach has built his campaign for the office around plans to sue President Biden's administration over various policies and executive orders. When there is a threat from Washington to the constitutional rights of Kansans, there is only one official, only one person who can step in and stop them, and that's the Kansas Attorney General. Thursday's debate covered several issues, one of the most prominent being fentanyl. Mann says his office would support a bill that would legalize test strips. From there, we need to work with law enforcement, improve our investigations, improve our prosecutions to hold offenders accountable. Kobach says he doesn't necessarily oppose that move, but needs to read more into the bill to make sure there isn't any sort of unintended consequences. One option he does support is making distributing the drug a more severe offense. If death results from the sale of this drug, then the penalty of the person who sold the drug is enhanced. So any surprises out of this debate, Phil? I think that <clears throat> Mr. Mann is essentially in the same place and a little bit deeper hole than Attorney General Schmidt. That the first thing he has to do is get voters acquainted with him and he has not accomplished that. And so I think that just like with Trump, there are people out there that say never Kobach. And so that may be reflected in his numbers and actually he may be a lot weaker than it appears with them neck and neck because he's got to gain ground and he's got to gain it at a higher rate than Chris. Chris had pretty high negatives when he lost the governor's race. They didn't move very much for the duration of the campaign. I think everybody out there knows Chris and nobody knows Mr. Mann. So we'll see how that one turns out. Okay, Beth, how big of a deal is that, the not being known by the public and is it something that can change in the few weeks we have left in this campaign? Absolutely. I think name recognition is critical for man and just getting people to know who he is and um, to distinguish himself from Kobach. I mean, I think the good news for man is that he's facing a candidate with very high disapproval ratings. And so that's a good thing for him. Um, but without name recognition, I think people who even people who might be opposed to Kobach's sort of um, overall tenor and and policies still don't know who man is and I think that's a problem going into Octo almost October at this point. Okay, Henry, this is your party, your candidate. What are Democrats doing uh, about the name recognition issue? I think it, it cl clearly it's an issue and a problem for him. Uh, he doesn't have as many positives, but I think Kobach's going to top out. I, I think that everybody knows Kobach, and he's more interested in the national level, in suing Biden. And, you know, in fact, I can't believe some of the discussion that the state chamber, a Republican organization, said about him. You know, we need an attorney general for Kansas, not that's going off gallivanting around the country trying to deal with some other issues. And he may want to join other attorney generals suing a president or whoever the president is. But the first thing is to take care of law enforcement here in Kansas. And that message is only coming from the man. Today, he didn't. He, Mr. Mann was endorsed by the Kansas Livestock Association. Four years ago, Governor Kelly was endorsed by the Farm Bureau. And agriculture needs people to work. And I think that's based on Chris's immigration work. And that could be an important tipping point in the race too when we see what the first district does and what that portion of the second district does that's agriculture, which is like three quarters of it. That's an interesting point. Of course, it all depends on how we end up voting and who ends up voting and how you cast your vote on paper or a machine could be decided by a court this year. That's what six Kansans are hoping for anyway after filing a lawsuit in U.S. District Court.
And the Kansas Reflector reports six people filed suit this week asking a federal judge to issue an injunction against the state, barring it from using electronic machines for voting on November 8th, except in the case of voters with disabilities. The lawsuit specifically names Secretary of State Scott Schwab, Attorney General Derek Schmidt, Governor Laura Kelly, and Brian Kasky, Schwab's Director of Elections. The 77-page petition says voting misconduct led to Donald Trump's 2020 win in Kansas and the defeat of a proposed abortion amendment last month. They want the court to void the 2020 election and order the Attorney General's office to begin a criminal investigation of Scott Schwab, as well as issue a ban on using those electronic voting machines. Schwab's spokesperson told the reflector it was unfortunate the petitioners have been misled and preyed upon by those who wish to undermine voter confidence in the security and outcome of Kansas elections. The statement added the demand for a redo of the 2020 vote ignored reality. The Secretary of State's office says no case of election fraud has been prosecuted in any of Kansas 105 counties in the last presidential election. Meanwhile, the lawsuit filed earlier this month says the petitioners have researched or have firsthand knowledge of overwhelming evidence that electronic voting systems are not safe and secure, which undermines the voters' intent, therefore violating fundamental voting rights according to the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Okay, well, this sounds very familiar, but Beth, as far as I know, we have had no proof anywhere of any form of fraud in this last election. Yeah, I mean, this is a pattern we see nationwide. We're seeing, you know, not just these claims of voter fraud spreading on social media, but newer this, I think, post-election cycle is the pursuit of lawsuits on um, the part of individual citizens against sort of the 2020 election or the 2022 August 2nd vote, um, which is which is somewhat unique. Uh, but the idea of you know, people suing or pursuing action in the courts is not all that unusual when it comes to elections. It's just never received as much attention as it has, well, frankly, since 2020 and um, Trump's uh, claims of fraud and stolen election. Yeah. And I know here in Central County, we had a similar lawsuit over one of the votes got tossed out. Phil, we're running out of time here also when it comes yeah. to actually running the election to make any sort of changes like this. I don't see how these guys have standing. You know why they call, call it Newsmax.com? Because Nuts.com was already taken. <laughs> the Republican said that. I, not, the, not the journalist. <laughs> so is there any way then to combat this kind of feeling among certain members of the voting public? Henry? Do you have any ideas? You give all of them an opportunity to voice their opinion. And in this case, a, re a Democrat stands with the Secretary of State because he does a good job. I may not agree with him all the time, but in most cases, he, he does what's best for the state. And those, that's the kind of elected officials we want of either party. All right. Well, on that uh, kumbaya moment, <laughs> we're going to move on to our final topic. <laughs> A fight over liquor licenses brewing in Hutchinson, despite more than $16,000 in sales in just one night. What's going on? Cakes Maeve Ashbrook explains. Over $25,000 in food sales. That's what's standing between Sandhills Brewing and Hutchinson staying open after the state denied its request to renew its liquor license. We are a brewery with a tap room that happens to offer limited food service for the people that want it. But at the end of the day, we can't force people to buy pizzas and pretzels. But this week, a miracle. We thought there was a chance and we thought that the community would back us and that they would come out and support us. Co-founder Pippin Williamson says Tuesday night, his brewery sold over $16,700 worth of food. A plan hatched and sent out to customers over social media just hours before. Our building was at full capacity, wall to wall, line out the door, and it stayed that way for five straight hours. It's because of a referendum Reno County added to a state statute decades ago, requiring drinking establishments to produce at least 30% of their total revenue in food sales. Everything I've heard thus far has been a surprise. Uh, a lot of proponents to bringing it back to a vote. Reno County Commissioner Daniel Friesen says people would have to vote in an election to change that. We want to learn from Pippin's experience and, and don't want to um, have other small businesses uh, 
in the county be negatively affected by this. And Williamson says he's going to keep trying to change the rule despite this week's unexpected strides. That was a testament to uh, what we have what we've been trying to build, and it was also a statement of of belief. And Henry, you're still in the state legislature. Not unusual for laws to kind of lag a little bit behind daily life there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but our liquor laws are just crazy in some respects. Let's let's be before COVID started, you couldn't go to a fast food place and get a mixed drink. Now you can drive through uh, some fast food restaurants and get a mixed drink as long as it's covered. Now. Funny, this, I thought that was crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> and it was done without a legislative vote. So do I think that he has a legitimate problem? Yeah. And in fact, if, if he can't get anybody else to, I'll introduce the legislation and ch try to change it. Because we should make it easier and agreeable and rational uh, for, for small business people. All right. Well, and the other issue that really kind of stuck out with to me on this is the fact that in Reno County, if you have a petition with 15% of the voters signing it, you can force an issue onto the public agenda for a public vote. You don't have that at the option at yeah. the state level. Beth, what is up with that? Because Missouri has it. Yeah, well, the state's very dramatically in sort of the ability of regular citizens to introduce legislation and or um, form a sort of uh, have a vote on that legislation. But it is way more common at the local level than it is either statewide, and obviously it doesn't exist at the national level. All right. Well, and that's certainly a topic that is going to keep a lot of people talking because folks like their local eateries. But you know, I, what did I tell my kids <laughs> in high school? I go, your failure to plan is not an emergency. And this guy should have been planning on selling food and having a menu from the very beginning. He knew what the ordinance was, he knew what his license was, he knew what his obligation was, I, I hope. And, you know, it's a local ordinance, they can have their vote. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I understand, I feel for him, but you know, I, I think it's his own making is from what I could gather. All right. Well, whether it's the law or his own makings, we are out of time. Thank you all, Beth, Henry, Phil, for joining us this week. I hope you and our audience have enjoyed our discussion. We'd also like to thank our news partners at Cake News, KSN News, and the Wichita Eagle for sharing their materials with us. We'd love to continue the conversation with, with you at any time. Just shoot us an email at kansasweek at kpts.org. For now, stay safe and have a great week.